All right, well, this morning I'm going to actually deal uh, somewhat with the passage I've already read from Second Peter, but there's also an idea that uh, we're going to kind of kick off with uh, as we launch out into the subject of how we can grow in our love for God, which is our goal as Christians, which is what Peter was telling us, you know, and again, remember to love the Father and to love the Son is really the same thing. Not that they're the same person, but again, Jesus is the Son of God in our nature. He is the one who is exactly like the Father. So if we love the Father, we're also going to love Him. And of course, the Spirit also shares that same image. So we're going to examine growing in love for God. And um, two points, really, requires effort on our part. It doesn't happen automatically. And then we're going to look at one, one thing to begin with. But let's, let's get that one thing from this passage. Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 6. Now, he says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval. By faith, we understand the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. Now, if I were to ask you, what do you think I'm going to talk about from this passage, right? We have to believe that God exists. And, you know, that Abel did. And he knew what his God was like. So he did what was pleasing him. He loved Him. And the same thing with Enoch. He walked with God. Why? Because he believed that God existed and that God had brought him into a relationship with him. So these are sometimes things we don't take into account. So anyway, it may sound like kind of an obvious point, but sometimes it isn't quite so obvious. All right. Well, let's, um, let's look at, at this whole subject this morning as we kick off, beginning with a little bit of review. Now, again, remember, we have been examining the fact that it's really Edward's thesis, but not just his alone. It comes from the Bible, of course, you know, I mean, that's, he's drawing his information from the Bible in the religious affections, which is a commentary on what a true believer is. What is a true work of the Holy Spirit? How can you identify it? How can you recognize it when you see it? Well, it, it all has to do with love. Love, and that's what we've been looking at. Christianity is all about love, and it shouldn't surprise us because, as John tells us in 1 John 4, 16, God is love. And maybe sometimes we get a different idea, and we look at God's wrath in the Old Testament, and we say, God is love? But it is true. He is love. Even that exhibits his love. This is his most outstanding moral characteristic, one from which all his other moral attributes flow, and that would include his justice, which includes his wrath, and his grace, and his mercy, which we normally think of as love. Now, that's because we need to understand God's love correctly, okay? God's love is a love for that which is truly lovely, right? That which is good, and that which is right, and that is what we mean. That's what the Bible talks about when it says God is holy. Holiness, we usually think of as being separate from sin. And that's what he is. He is separate from sin. Everything that's evil, everything that's corrupt, even from sinners. But it's also the love of what is good and right. It's his love for what is good that makes him separate himself from evil. So not surprisingly, the law that he gives to us, the Ten Commandments, are all about love as well. They are fulfilled or satisfied by love. Remember how Paul writes in Romans 13, verse 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So love fulfills 
the law towards our neighbor, but in likewise, it does the same towards God. Okay? We love God by, by keeping those first four commandments. We love our neighbor by keeping the other six. The commandments are all about love, and that is what it means to be holy and separate from sin, okay? is to love in the right way. Now, Jesus told us the same thing when he said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. We need to ask ourselves the question, do we love him that way? Well, that's what he commands us to do, and that's why we need to learn how to do this. And, of course, the second Jesus said is to love our neighbor as ourselves. Love is why the Father sent His Son into the world to save us, and love is why the Son was willing to come and lay down His life for us. Love is why Jesus gave us His Holy Spirit, so that we also would love in the same way. David was called a man after God's own heart, and why? It's because he loved God, and he loved His ways. Paul served Jesus with his whole life on earth, and certainly put himself through a great deal of suffering and grief and wanted nothing more than to be with his Savior in heaven. And why did he do that? It's because he loved him. And certainly Jesus is the perfect example of love. Jesus faithfully worshipped his Father. Jesus faithfully fellowshiped with his Father in prayer. He was ready at all times to defend his honor. He always obeyed him. You know, both... The, well, all Ten Commandments, he loved his father and his neighbor. And, of course, he loved God in the fulfillment of his mission for which he sent him into the world. Okay, Jesus is all about love. Now, we have all of this set before us, and the question is, what do we want to be? You know, what kind of person do we want to be? What kind of people? Do we want to see that same kind of love in ourselves? Do we want to love God in the same way that these love God, especially Jesus? Well, certainly we do, right? As Christians, we do. The Spirit of God is working that within us. Now, we have to recognize that we're not going to be able to reach the same level that Jesus was at. But what about these other two? You know, what about David and Paul? Can, can we reach that level? I think we can, you know, we want to, might want to say that, that um, well, you know, what, what is the limit to, you know, as far as we can go? We can actually outdo them, you know. God has given us the tools to do this, and that's what I want us to consider is what do we have to do? Because I think we often think, too often think, that just by going through certain motions, using the means of grace, you know, coming to the church maybe uh, for a service, or maybe spending a few moments in prayer, that we're going to get all we can get, and we're going to grow as far as we can grow. But there's a lot more that we can do. So how can we strengthen our affection for the Father and for His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the first thing, as I said, that we need to consider is that there is something we must do. Now, again, this is where you begin to walk that razor's edge. You know, it's kind of like... Got to make sure we distinguish what's our role and what's God's role. We want to make sure that we don't turn Christianity into a, a religion of works. But we do need to realize that there is work that's involved in this particular uh, subject. Okay? If our love is to grow stronger, okay, there must be some real effort on our part because that is the way God has made this to work. Now, again, sometimes we get confused about justification and sanctification, don't we? Okay? We tend to slip into the idea that we have to make ourselves good enough before God is ever going to accept us. You know? So we try to clean up our act before we come to God, and we know that's not the case. We never can do that. And then we also tend to think once we've come to Him and we're okay with Him, that we need to um, you know, keep up a certain level of works for God to hold on to us, otherwise He's going to boot us out of His family. Okay? We, we tend to, to confuse our works with justification. I think we, we understand now that justification is really all about Christ. Okay? It's all about what He has done, His obedience, His death on the cross, and simply we need to trust Him. But again, we need to be reminded 
But in the same way, I think we can become confused over a couple of other terms that we use in Christianity to sort of, you know, use as shortcuts to these particular topics. And those are the fancy words, regeneration and sanctification. Okay, regeneration and sanctification, they are not the same thing. They do not work in the same way. Now, regeneration is that new birth, okay, where Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. That's where the Spirit works alone to raise us from death spiritually to spiritual life. That's when he puts that love in our hearts that we've been talking about. When he gives us what Paul said to the Galatians, that faith that works by love, that's the only kind of faith that can save us. It's a faith that loves Jesus, actually wants him as a savior. That enables us to trust him. And when we trust Him, we're justified, okay? In all of that, God works by Himself. He works alone. The Spirit of God works alone. But sanctification is not the same way. Growth in grace, growth in love is different. It requires work on our part, very hard work, as a matter of fact. Okay, Paul writes in Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13, these strange words that especially if you believe in justification by grace through faith alone, you read this and you say, what does this mean? He says this to the Philippians, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That sounds like justification by works, doesn't it? But then he goes on to say, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So what is Paul talking about here? He's not talking about justification. Because salvation does not always mean justification. Salvation is the whole package. It refers to justification and sanctification. It includes growth in grace. And what he says here is that there's a work you need to do. You need to be pursuing Christ's likeness. But remember that when you do this, God is doing this work in you by his Holy Spirit. He's the one who gives us the desire to do this work. But we must pursue it. Now, again, let me remind you what Peter said in our text this morning. In 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 11, which I'm not going to read again for the, in the interest of time. But he says that we are to pursue these particular virtues and particularly love diligently, okay? Pursue it diligently. Does that sound like inactivity, you know? Does it sound like there's nothing we need to do? Actually, it sounds like a race. It sounds like a struggle. It sounds like a great deal of effort that's being made. We need to remember that justification is not the end. You see, oftentimes... uh, people who, uh, let's say, professing Christians, who believe that they're Christians, they think because they've professed faith in Christ or maybe they've prayed the sinner's prayer that that's the end. They've reached the goal, and now they can kind of just go and do what they want to do because they're safe. But we need to remember justification is not the, the, the goal. It's not the end. It's the beginning. It's the beginning of the journey. The journey begins right there. And... You know, God has a plan. The plan is, once having saved us, He wants to make us like His Son. And He wants to do that so that we might advance His kingdom in the same way Jesus did. You know, we talk about the book of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles, right? Well, not really. It is, but there's another component that we forget. It's the acts of Jesus through his apostles as they seek to grow in grace and to do his work. And that's meant to be a pattern, really, for us. Paul writes in Titus 2, verse 14, that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us so that we can be happy and go to heaven and do what we want to in this world. No, he says he gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. That's the reason why Jesus gave himself for us is that he might redeem us so that we might be his possession, but also people 
who are zealous. Now, the word zealous is, is a word that you know, kind of ratchets the, the degree to which we are to be pursuing this. You know, pursue these things diligently. Be zealous for these things. Think about, again, what we read in Revelation chapter 3. I would that you are hot or cold, but don't be lukewarm. And all of these terms remind us that God wants heat. He wants us to be zealous for his kingdom. But that zeal requires love, and that love requires work. Okay, so what do we need to do? Well, you know, there's a lot that we need to do, right? But I thought this morning I would just give us one thing to think about, because I think it's one thing we often forget about, sadly. Okay, um, and it, it goes, you know, with the means of grace, but it goes a little bit beyond the means of grace, you know, because it's usually at this point we'd say, well, what we need to do is we just simply need to spend more time in the means of grace, in you know, God's Word, in prayer, in, in worship, in celebrating the Lord's Supper, and meditating on our baptism, on fellowship, and, and those things are very, very important. You know, we can't be sanctified without them. We cannot grow in love without these things. But I want us to begin with something a little bit more fundamental and basic, something we tend to take for granted, especially if we've been professing faith in Christ for a while, because usually, not, not always, but oftentimes when somebody comes to faith in Christ, there's like this burst of of light and reality that comes into their lives and suddenly they're face to face with God and isn't it all amazing and it's all everywhere around you. But then little by little, we tend to lose sight of God and we, we tend to get drawn back into the world and we seem to forget that there really is a Heavenly Father who has called us into a relationship with Himself through His Son and that He deserves all our heart, all of our love, all of our life. Now, the author to the Hebrews tells us in chapter 11, verse 6, that without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. He's telling us here, if we don't believe God exists, then we won't be able to please Him, right? We can't please Him because if we don't believe He exists, we're never going to seek Him. So why would we ever pursue someone, you know, um, at least in the way that we should, if we're not fully convinced that He even exists, right? And how will we ever love Him? I think this seeking of God and this faith, remember, is the faith that works by love. We're talking about love here. We're talking about faith. How will we ever love Him as we should if we do not believe Him? If we don't believe He exists, if we don't believe all this is true, right? How are we ever going to get ourselves to deny the pleasures of the world? How are we ever going to put ourselves through the hardships and perhaps the sufferings that we're called to go through if we're not convinced? Now again, let me point to our example, the Lord Jesus. Was Jesus convinced? Was He convinced that God was real? Of course. Of course he was. He was aware at every moment his father was present, okay? And that what he was doing either pleased him or didn't please him, and of course he always pleased him, right? But he was aware. You know, Jonathan Edwards refers to this in perhaps a more serious tone situation where he talks about that all-seeing eye. Now, that might be something that we only see on the back of a dollar bill, and that's the only time we think of it. But let's not forget, God is not just in heaven, Okay, God is everywhere equally with His whole being. He is here just as much as He is in heaven. And He does see everything. Well, we need to be aware of that, not just because He's watching us, but because we love Him. We we'll want Him to see us loving Him, and not just outwardly, but also inwardly. Now, I'm sure if we were to ask everyone here, whether or not we believe God existed, I think we'd all say yes, we'd all agree He exists. I mean, the evidence is just overwhelming. I think we see Him quite clearly through, the, through His creation, don't we? And we as believers have the Spirit's testimony in our, in our hearts. We know that God is, but even though that's true, we still struggle with doubt. I mean, which one among us can say, I have no doubt, you know? Or most of the time, I have no doubt, okay? We believe, 
But maybe we don't believe 100%. Maybe we're not fully convinced. And the thing is, we're not going to pursue him as we should and give ourselves to him in this way as we should unless we are 100% convinced, or I should say the more we're convinced to the degree that we do believe, to that degree we will pursue him. And to the degree that we doubt, any doubt is going to limit our love and our commitment. So maybe the question we should ask is, why do we doubt in the face of such overwhelming evidence? I mean, how, how can we? Don't you remember the apologetic series? I mean, that series brought us face to face with the, you know, the objective evidence for the reality of God, and it was, it was pretty potent, pretty powerful. But somehow, that effect has dissipated, and we know how that works, right? Because we, we're reminded of it, we begin to pursue it, but then something happens and we're not pursuing it like we thought we would anymore. Why is that? Well, it's because of the things that are working against us constantly, trying to get us, get our focus off of God and to actually bury Him so that we don't even think about Him. And, and those enemies, as you know well, are the world, our flesh, that onboard enemy that is always with us, and the devil, okay? We live, first of all, in a world that is at war with God. I mean, virtually the media is controlled by secular humanism, isn't it? So it's always going to be leaving God out of the picture. And it seems like whenever they do bring him in, it's always a false religion. If they're going to re represent Protestantism, it's always going to be some nut, right? Somebody who's, who's gone crazy. But if they're, if they're going to represent Christianity, it's going to be Roman Catholicism. But that is not true Christianity. The, again, all these things that the world is pushing on us are trying to push God out of the picture, and we need to be aware of that and not allow ourselves to adopt the worldview that is being presented. I think we can watch things critically. We just need to be careful we don't get sucked into them. You know, you can get sucked into a, a complete fantasy world that doesn't even exist. Uh, what exists is the world the Bible tells us about, and we need to keep that in front of us at all times. Now, we also have that ally of the world living within us called the flesh. That's the old man, the remaining sin that's in us, that desire against God, that, that hatred of God. We, we still have that in our hearts to some degree. And it's also trying to get us sucked into the world and to get our eyes off of God. It's very powerful. Uh, John Owen said on one occasion that it's always at work, always to trip us up, always trying to get us to circumvent the things we know we should be doing. You know, you've probably heard me use this illustration, but I think it really hits home. Whenever you, in the course of the day, find some time to spend alone with God, suddenly there's going to be all these ideas that rush into your mind saying, well, wait a minute, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you don't have time for this. And your flesh is going to do everything it can to get you away from the word so you won't be thinking about God and you will not, you know, again, focus on the things that are really important. So the flesh is at work. And then, of course, there are those very real spiritual beings. They are real. All of this is real, okay? That are fighting against us continually, the devil and his demons. Now, they cannot destroy us. They cannot destroy our souls. If we're in Christ, we're safe. But they can certainly distract us and neutralize us, and they're doing everything in their power to do exactly that so that we will not grow in grace and we will not become hot for the Lord because if we do that, then we are going to threaten Satan's kingdom, and so he's going to work overtime. Now, remember what Thomas Brooks writes, and I don't know if you were here for that. A long time ago, we talked about a book that I think we'd all do well to read, um, Thomas Brooks, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. He points out that, you know, that Satan is, is like a, a fisherman. You know, we know what fishing's all about. And he's a master fisherman. He knows exactly how to bait his hook for each one of us here. He knows our weaknesses. He knows what we're most likely going to fall into or fall for. And so that's exactly how he goes fishing for us, and oftentimes he succeeds. But it's also why Peter tells us that we need to be constantly on our guard against him. 1 Peter 5 8. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, 
That wasn't true just of the believers back then. It's equally true today. Your adversary, the devil, and it may not be the devil personally, but it may be one of his many demons. He's got plenty of them. Prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But, of course, we need to resist him. But how can you resist him if you don't aware that he's there, okay? When's the last time we even gave a thought to the fact that maybe some of the things we're struggling with, maybe even some of the temptations we're faced with are all coming from an invisible enemy? See, if we're not thinking along these lines, if our eyes are not open, if we're not of sober spirit and on the alert, well, then the devil has already succeeded, hasn't he? And the way he's done it, most likely for us, is by drawing us out into the world, a world which is just oblivious to this. I mean, anything goes out there pretty much. There's no fear of God out there, okay? That's what he's trying to do is wipe that out. So we need to be on the alert. Now, again, to the degree that our enemies succeed in getting us to take our eyes off of God, to that degree, we will fail in our pursuit to love Him. Remember, we need to be fully convinced, and we need to be fully convinced that we need to be pursuing Him. Otherwise, we're not going to do it, and we're not going to grow the way we should, and especially if we think there's nothing we need to do. Well, hopefully we understand there is something we need to do. So let me close by asking this question. What can we do to overcome these enemies and get our eyes back on God? This is, again, just the first step. Well, we do need to focus on the ways in which God has revealed himself, okay? Told you about that apologetic series? <laughs> How many of us have gone back through and looked at those uh, handouts? Or, or maybe you don't have them anymore. Maybe they're gone. But there was a lot of valuable stuff in there, okay? I think to review that evidence will bring you face-to-face -face with his reality in a very powerful way. I think there are other things we can do as well. We can go out to the mountains, go out to the desert, okay? During the daytime, but especially at night. And... and Gaze up at the starry skies. That, that always has a way of, of um, you know, just bringing us face to face with, with just how small we are and how vast the universe is and how great God is. Uh, we can go to the zoo and we can look at all the life he's created. Or maybe we can just step outside and watch the people that are walking around. Again, these things could not be without a personal God who has designing ability you know, to make all these things, again, the, the greatest argument, I think, is that from cause and effect. The effect, what we see, cannot be greater than the cause, right? Whatever made us, whatever caused us, has to be intelligent and purposeful and self-conscious and designing and all these things, you know. And he has to be great enough to do this on a cosmic scale. Well, maybe it would help us to listen again to the lectures that we heard. I thought they were actually amazing by Michael Behe and John Lennox and Stephen Meyer, if you remember those. Um, very powerful, the ones on design and the return of the God hypothesis. And review those arguments. You know, I, maybe I can take just a moment to um, review a couple of them. Remember Michael Behe's, the molecular biologist, he talked about irredu irreducible complexity. And what he said is inside of our cells, there are these machines, these molecular machines that are microscopic, that are made of all these moving parts that have to be just perfectly sized and fitted together for them to work. And yet there they are. And they're all working and they're all doing things inside the cell. And he didn't mention this, but as soon as you die, when a person dies, all those molecular machines, they just break apart, right? They stop working. But how they get put together in the first place? And how, did, how, did they, how are they actually operating in there? You know, they, all those parts had to be there at the same time. It all had to be designed. It all had to work that way. So it had to be created at the same time. You know, it couldn't have just happened randomly by parts being developed through time. And then Stephen Meyer brought that argument about gravity. You know, that was kind of a, a mind-blowing idea. I'm not sure if I wrap my head around it, but he was talking about how Einstein said that the theory of gravity says that if you 
if you bring all the mass of the universe together, and again, scientists believe that all the mass, that all the stuff that's out there in the universe all at one time was concentrated in one mass, you know, they call that the Big Bang when it blows up. But he said if all that matter was concentrated into one mass, he said gravity would be so overwhelming that space would disappear. He said there, there would be nothing, right? So he said, if it was all together at one time, there was a time when there was actually nothing. And if there was nothing at the beginning, what could there be now? Nothing. Because out of nothing, nothing comes. Gravity proves that there is an ultimate beginning to everything, that everything came out of nothing. But it couldn't have come by itself. There must be one who made it, okay, who created it. And Einstein saw the, the force of that. Einstein believed in God. And then Stephen Myers, the finely tuned universe, how all these different laws and forces are at work, and if, and if any of them were, were adjusted, even in the slightest, even gravity, I forget what the exact measurement was, but if we weighed something like a billionth of a gram more than we weigh right now, as far as the force of gravity making us that much heavier, life would be impossible. You talked about the universe making machine, you go, you know, you're traveling through space, you find this, this machine, and you go inside, and you see all these dials, you know, they're just precisely adjusted, and if you grab one of those dials and change it just a little bit, life would just evaporate. You know, the, the universe is finely tuned, and that does not happen accidentally. See, we need to let the weight of all this evidence push the deception of the enemy away and keep our eyes open to God. And we also, of course, need to immerse ourselves in the means of grace, right, in God's Word to let the Spirit of God show us what is real and what is not real. Because how do you know what's real? How do you know what the scientists are saying is true or not true regarding origins, okay? Again, the Bible is not a chemistry textbook, it's not a biology textbook, but it does tell us how we got here and it tells us when we got here. How do we know, you know, it's, it's right or wrong? What the scientist tells us about origins because of what the Bible says. And we're gonna, we're gonna get to that too. We do need to be convinced of that. So let me close again with a couple of things we saw recently. First of all, that illustration by Dr. Reeves. Remember from C.S. Lewis's The Silver Chair? He was warning, and I forget the name of the, of the gal who was going from Aslan's country down into Narnia. And he says, remember the thickness of the air down there. Remember the signs. You need to keep those in front of you, and you need to keep rehearsing them because you're going to forget. Well, he was talking about this very thing we're talking about here. This world is a very thick you know, environment and atmosphere and it tends to draw us away from God. So we need to keep the signs in front of us at all times so that we do not forget. And then the point that Jim Lemon made when he was um, speaking to us out of Psalm 73, how the psalmist, as he looked at the prosperity of the wicked, and we do the same thing, right? And how he almost stumbled as he saw how easy it was for them and how hard it was for him and he says, I almost stumbled until I went into the house of God. Then I realized, surely you set them in slippery places, how they are cast down destruction in a moment. Okay, he realized their end. And he realized his end was much more glorious and how we need to, to be in worship so that we'll get our perspective corrected. We need to go into the house of God and see the way things really are. That's what we're doing right now. We're, we're looking at how things really are so that we'll keep our eyes focused upon Him. So the point is, we need to believe, okay? We need to have faith, faith that God is, and keep our eyes focused on Him. And then we need to pursue Him. We need to seek to know Him and realize that that, it, there's a lot of hard work involved in that, and sometimes that requires suffering. Remember when Paul said, I want to know Christ, not just the power of His resurrection, but the fellowship of His sufferings, because that's when we really get to know Him. And, of course, we need to do this diligently, because it doesn't happen automatically. We don't just say, you know, in a few moment prayer, Lord, help me to grow in grace, and then thank you for this food. You know, that isn't going to cut it, is it? You know, we need to do some really hard work, reading the Bible, seeing what it says, doing what it says. But again, this first step, 
realizing that all of this is real, okay? God is real, and it really makes a difference to Him what we are doing, okay? And our task is to love Him and for Him to see us loving Him by pursuing Him. Well, again, that's just the first step. Next week, we'll look at another. And this evening, remember, we're going to look at that pure religion in heaven. So we're going to kind of consider heaven in general. So it'll be, I think, an encouraging uh, look into what the Bible says about that place that we all hope to go to someday uh, by the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer. And as we do, let's also prepare for the table.